Speaking of which, let's watch the new uh, GDF video about how Israel cucked the United States. In July of and let's 2000, learn more. a team of historians and political scientists sat down to interview Bob Gates for the George Herbert Walker Bush Oral History Project. Gates was CIA director during Bush's tenure. These were eventful years, and so the men spoke of the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Somalia, German reunification, a fascinating insider perspective into the first Bush White House. An enemy. An enemy to Israel. Amid the interview, historian H. William Brands asks the old spy chief a question many were doubtless curious to know. Was there anybody that George Bush actively disliked? Shamir. <laughs> Gates, of course, is referring to Yitzhak Shamir, the Israeli prime minister at the time. But I will say this, every president I worked for at some point in his presidency Mega would get so pissed off at the Israelis that he couldn't speak. It didn't matter whether it was Jimmy Carter or Jerry Ford or Ronald Reagan or George Bush, something would happen and they would just absolutely go screw themselves right into the ceiling they were so angry and they'd sort of rant and rave around the Oval Office. I think it was their frustration about knowing that there was so little they could do about it because of domestic politics and everything else that was so frustrating to them. But he did not, I think, care very much for Shamir. I'm trying to think about others, but I can't think of any others. No doubt two decades before Bush was even sworn in as president, Lyndon Baines Johnson was feeling just as angry and ineffectual. It was the morning of June 8, 1967. Navy Ensign John Diedrich Scott turned 24 years old. His birthday was business as usual. His crew was stationed in the Mediterranean after having traveled all the way from West Africa. It was an early morning. Just before 4 a.m., he'd get to work. Deck watch. At about the exact same time, a Nord Nor Atlas took to the sky to begin an... Wait. I sh I hope I hope nothing crazy happens to the USS Liberty, especially not in the hands of our most significant, most important ally, which is not even an ally at all, but just a mere extension of the U.S. state. An air reconnaissance patrol. The plane, belonging to the Israeli Air Force, was patrolling along the Mediterranean coast to detect ships beyond radar range. There was only one. It was Navy Ensign Scott's ship. On the bridge, Scott spotted the plane. He grabbed his binoculars to get a better view. A flying boxcar with a double fuselage and twin engines. Just 15 minutes before, Scott had watched the ship's American flag being pulled by the wind. Up in the cockpit of the Noratlas, an Israeli naval officer scanned below, serving as an aerial observer. At 5.45, the plane began reporting that the ship was a destroyer. Less than 20 minutes later, though, According to an official Israeli history, the plane reported that it was, in fact, a U.S. Navy supply ship. The observer had even spotted the ship's hull markings, GTR-5. And the plane's crew radioed the information to ground control. Upon landing, the observer was debriefed by a Lieutenant Commander Pinchasi of Air Command. After which, according to an official Israeli inquiry, the identification of the ship was determined to be the U.S. Navy ship Liberty. Hi, my name is GDF, and you can probably tell by the direction that this video is going in that I'm not very advertiser friendly. For that reason, I rely completely on my patrons, subscribers, and donations. Hours before the attack, Israel knew not only that an American ship sailed nearby, but that it was the spy ship Liberty. Aboard the USS Liberty was a Signals Intelligence and Cryptology Command called the Naval Security Group, an organization which reported to the National Security Agency, the NSA. It was a spy ship, yeah, for the NSA. The problem is, it was spying at the behest of the Israeli government. It's not like, it's not like it, it's, I mean, there's no world in which, like, <laughs> blowing up that ship is allowed or correct. It's just extra funny that they did it, even though they are allies. NSA. Oh, fuck. I just gave you spoilers. God damn it. 
outfitted with 45 towering antennas and a satellite dish on the ship's stern which bounced messages off the moon to Washington, the ship's true mission was a poorly kept secret. Ugliest ship in the Navy and uh, the most unusual and therefore the easiest of all uh, ships to recognize. The ship's captain, William McGonagall, would later testify that the configuration of the ship with unusual mast antennae arrangements had resulted in some surveillance from the southwest African countries during its first two deployments. Its usual stomping grounds. African art and masks decorated the ship's walls. Summer 1967 was supposed to entail steaming off to Angola, Liberia, and Gabon. From the port of Abidjan, however, the ship received new marching orders. Late spring saw things heat up rapidly in the Middle East. Egypt and Israel appeared ever closer to war. The ship was now to sail towards Spain, and finally, off of the Sinai Peninsula. It was here that the Liberty was to listen in on communications flying between the warring parties of the ensuing Six-Day War. Each day, beginning with Israel's preemptive attack on Egypt, the Liberty was sending a steady stream of updates back to Washington about Israel's capturing the Sinai and the West Bank, including the old city of Jerusalem, in just the first three days. The ship was very much not a battleship, and as we shall see, almost completely defenseless. The Liberty carried no cannons, and was armed with four Browning 50 caliber machine guns. The ship's four-page gunnery doctrine declared the mounted gun's primary function was to repel boarders, not shoot down fighters. The ship's infirmary was, in turn, not outfitted for war zones. Out of a crew of almost 300, the main ward could accommodate just four patients. On a previous cruise, a sailor had to be evacuated to a hospital in Senegal for appendicitis. <laughs> the examination room, with its lone surgical table, carried sutures and local anesthetic. However, the sailors did not have much reason to believe they'd be targeted for attack by anyone. Its flag flying on its mast, its freshly painted hull markings, its configuration, size, and speed, coupled with the clear weather and lack of surrounding ships, made an attack all the less likely. After all, no nation had ever attacked a spy ship, so the worries were not overt, particularly because the Liberty sailed in international waters. Navy Ensign Scott still had eyes on the plane, and even shot four photos with a 35mm camera. The plane circled around several times, then took off in a true direction toward Tel Aviv. A single jet aircraft circled the ship at 8.50. Two more jets circled three times at 10.30. 11 a.m. another plane circled. More planes came at 11.30, 11.45, 12.20, 12.20, 12.45. The weather log on the Liberty showed clear skies, calm seas, and excellent visibility north of the Sinai on June 8, 1967. The calm preceded a vicious storm. Just before... U.S. Navy vet here. This incident is why the U.S. doesn't sail spy ships anymore. So extremely very ultra rare Israeli W. I mean, it doesn't really matter because <laughs> aren't all the Navy ships functionally spy ships now anyway? It just means that like any ship that the Navy flies is no longer a, a, a civilian vessel, but instead directly just a, a, a vehicle for war. We use submarines for that now. We did that slash do that, I promise. 2 p.m., Captain McGonagall peered through binoculars from the starboard wing. He spotted a fighter jet. Also, yeah, we have satellites, we have submarines, we have so much. Ensign Patrick O'Malley studied the radar. On the screen were three blips. We've got three unidentified vessels, steady bearing, decreasing range, coming right at us. I said, Captain, I've never seen anything approach the ship this fast. McGonagall turned to Lieutenant Junior Grade Lloyd Painter. I think they're going to attack. French-made Mirage jets strafed the Liberty. The bridge was first. Rockets and 30-millimeter cannon rounds pummeled the vessel. Shrapnel flew everywhere. And I could see orange flashes just uh, dancing down the, down the deck. Men in the forward gun mounts, uh, both, both forward gun mounts were literally blown into the air and end over end. The Liberty never stood a chance. From just the first burst of bombs and bullets, the ship's machine guns were destroyed. Antennae were smashed. Basketball-sized craters littered the deck and bridge. 
Mm-hmm. McGonagall alerted the crew to increase speed to maximum power, but the jets had blown out one of the ship's two boilers. The Liberty's max speed would be just about 13 miles per hour. Jets tag-teamed the ship and huh. attacked it in a crisscross formation. The fighters first strafed the Liberty from bow to stern, targeting the bridge, machine guns, and antennae. With those destroyed or on fire, the attackers crisscrossed the spy ship to target the engine room, the Liberty's heart. The attacks came in waves, about every minute. Radioing for help proved increasingly impossible as the jets targeted each of the ship's 45 antennae. Six minutes into the attack, the radiomen switched transmitters hoping to get a message out, but the receiver blared feedback noise. Thinking this was just a malfunction, the men were horrified to find the same noise on every frequency, leading the radio men to conclude that the attackers had jammed the Liberty's communications, <laughs> since only between the attacks could the operators receive signals. The Mirage fighters were just the beginning. The second phase of the attack saw the fighters replaced by Mister bombers armed with napalm. Burning at 3,000 degrees, the explosion sent smoke barreling through the bridge, Bits of flaming jelly charred walls and blistered paint. Fuel barrels caught fire and sent more smoke in the air. After un- Wait, who carried out this attack? Nobody knows. Israel, man. Israel did. Israel blew up. USS Liberty. What do you mean? Oh, who could have done this? <laughs> Unloading their payloads, Israel. the bombers too vanished. There was now another calm in the skies, though not aboard the Liberty. Imagine if any other country did this. Brother, I don't have to imagine... I can I can tell you that part of the reason why we escalated conflict in Vietnam was because of a fake incident on a marine vessel, a US marked marine vessel. Like we have literally in the past used an attack on a a ship, an American ship to literally say we're going to go to war with a country. Spanish American War, remember the main no, I was talking about Vietnam, too. So this is like, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much for America to be like, oh, dude, yeah, I can't believe you shot at our vessel. Uh, <laughs> time, to, time to go to war, except for when Israel does it, in which case we're like, nope, never mind. We would love to, we would, we loved it, sir. Thank you so much. Please give us more. Recently, Biden said that the ongoing Israeli offensive against the southern Gaza city of Rafah is wrong and he pledged to stop supplying offensive weapons if the assault proceeds. One week later, however, Israeli forces have seized the Rafah border crossing and pushed into the city, where more than 1.5 million Palestinians are sheltering. Still, US media reported on Tuesday that Biden plans to advance a 1 billion arms transfer to Israel, including tank shells. Advocates say, the apparent contradiction between pressuring Israel to stop its offensive, then offering further weaponry, is part of a broader pattern whereby the U.S. says one thing but does another. Whose deck was strewn with dead and dying. But still, the worst was yet to come. As those three blips on the radar screen still hadn't arrived yet. The torpedo boats that, that happened to have been the three uh, blips that I had seen on the radar scope had reached us and were now firing armor-piercing bullets through the ship. McGonagall again pulled up his binoculars and saw, some 15 miles off the starboard side, three torpedo boats coming straight toward him. The skipper ordered new men to replace the dead ones at the 50 cals and a new American flag raised to replace the one knocked down by the jets. They grabbed the largest one they had, 7 by 13 feet, and pulled it up the mast at 2.26 p.m. Up until now, the ship's crew had no idea who was even attacking them. Egyptians? Soviets? I saw what appeared to me to be an Israeli flag on one of the boats. No doubt McGonagall was stunned to find, as the torpedo boats approached some 2,000 yards away, a blue and white flag with a Star of David in the center. The boats then opened fire. Along (laughs) with 50 cows of their own, the ships also possessed 20 and 40 millimeter cannons. These weapons, of course, were designed to create a distraction as their gunners manually aimed torpedoes at the Liberty. Nearly 300 sailors now prepared for the unthinkable. Not since the waning days of World War II. Why did they attack? Um, they, they thought it was Hamas. World War II. No, I'm and kidding. before many of the Liberty's crew members were even born, 
had another nation torpedoed an American ship. At 2.34 p.m., McGonagall watched a torpedo gliding underneath the water, which flew past the Liberty stern by 25 yards, but the Israeli boats had fired five. At 2.35 p.m., the Liberty was lifted out of the water and sloshed back down. The power was out, all the generators and even the steering had failed. A single torpedo had slammed directly into the ship's starboard side, blasting a hole 39 feet wide and 24 feet tall. Water cascaded into the ship. Oil, classified documents, key cards. They thought the ship might have children on it, <laughs> and they got really excited to kill them. And bodies poured out into the sea. 25 sailors were killed by the explosion. If not during the eight reconnaissance flights over the Liberty, then certainly amid the attack from the fighter jets and bombers, the Liberty was identified for what it was, according to Lieutenant Colonel Shmuel Kislev, then Israel's chief air controller at General Headquarters in Tel Aviv. The Air Force stops all operations and says, all our aircraft, all our attack aircraft, please stop. I must say that at that point in time, in my mind, it was an American ship. By the way, this is precisely the reason why I always laugh when people are like, um, what do you think would happen if, like, Israel uh, attacked American soldiers? I'm like, what do you mean? What do I think would happen in a hypothetical? It has happened. We know what happens when Israel does this, okay? We just act like it didn't happen. That's why there's probably Navy veterans in here, and this is the first time they've ever heard of this incident or at least in another uh, instance where I've covered the USS Liberty. That's, that's it. Like, <laughs> we say, sorry, sir. I apologize for being there. You thought it was an American ship? I was quite certain it was an American ship. More than 20 minutes before the fatal torpedo strike that killed 25 sailors, Israel's chief air controller conclusively identified the Liberty as an American ship. Navy Ensign John Scott, preempting another torpedo blast, instructed his men to grab life preservers and prepare to abandon ship. The men dropped several life rafts overboard, but Lieutenant Painter watched in... Yeah, usually the this chatter is right, by the way. Like, for the most part, the people that bring up the USS Liberty are people... Hassan, try not to do ad hominem attacks in possible difficulty. Dude, come on. Come on, dude. The only ad hominem attack is the top of the hour ad attack, okay? It's three minutes long, and you're gonna fucking see it. If you think that this bait is good enough, like the last two baits, that's lazy, okay? That's lazy. It's too lazy for you. Yeah, fuck off! Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Weak bait. Weak fucking bait. You can't catch me slipping now. I'm aware. I'm, I'm woke to the ways in which this chat spends every fucking minute coming up to the top of the goddamn hour okay yeah i'm i'm awake now i'm wide awake i've grown uh, yeah your baits have gotten me stronger I'm, I'm stronger and better than before weak baits will get you nowhere okay at the top of the hour however you'll see a three minute ad break unless you subscribe for five dollars or for free with a twitch prime by connecting your amazon prime account to your twitch account you get one free prime subscription month there's a three minute ad break now horror as one of the torpedo boats zoomed past and machine gunned the rubber rafts. The torpedo boats continued to rain shit. Lately the chaos god, think of the five get the and armor piercing 50 caliber rounds at the ship. Finally, the firing stopped. One of the torpedo boats approached to about 500 yards away from the Liberty. At this point, the Liberty's crew were using a lamp to signal U.S. naval ship. Bizarrely, the torpedo boat signaled back, do you need help? No, they replied. Do you want us to stand by? No, thank you, they replied, followed by the last communication from the Israeli vessel. Good luck. <laughs> it was still morning in Washington. At 11.04 a.m., President John... Is this why right-wingers hate learning, especially history? Because then we find out these truths. No, right-wingers love the USS Liberty. Nazis fucking talk about it all the time. Nazis who are anti-Semitic, and that is the reason why they hate Israel because they're jealous that Israel gets to have an ethno state for Jewish people and they don't get to have a white ethno state for white people in America um, who just hate Jewish people because they think that all of the, 
the Hitlerian arguments are real, those freaks love talking about USS Liberty because it's like a, it is a very, it is a, it is a very clear, uh, shameful moment. They're always jealous of Israel and Japan. True, they also are very jealous of of Japan too. Johnson left his White House residence. He had just learned what happened. He stopped at the Oval Office and then made his way into- Yeah, they also think it's hidden knowledge. That's the other thing that's like funny. They're like, ooh, what about the U.S. liberty? It's like, yeah, what about it, man? At the Situation Room, where he was greeted by Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Walt Rostow, the National Security Advisor. Also joining them was Clark Clifford, Chairman of the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. We were baffled. Clifford later wrote in his memoir, Counsel to the President. From the beginning, there was skepticism and disbelief about the Israeli version of events. We had enormous respect for Israeli intelligence, and it was difficult to believe the Liberty had been attacked by mistake. Every conceivable theory was advanced that morning. It became clear that from the sketchy information available, we could not figure out what had happened. Despite doubts in the Johnson administration, and as we shall see, from Johnson himself, Congress was either completely silent or came to Israel's defense. As the Liberty crew was clinging to life, turning their mess hall into a makeshift emergency room, plugging hundreds of shell holes to keep the tilting ship from fl- Is being anti-Sionist bad? This guy has to be Turkish, right? Sionist. What? No. And being anti-Zionist is not bad at all. It's very good. Um, anyway, the thing I was going to say is that at the time, we should have glass Israel over this. Fuck no. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me, dude? Israel was a, was an incredibly important ally in a region where we had a lot of interest and very real fears that all of the other anti-Israel countries were going to align with the USSR. Israel could have killed hundreds more American soldiers in that area in that same time frame, and America still would have been like, dude, what are you talking about? No, it's fine. Nothing happened there. Shut the fuck up flooding and counting 34 dead sailors, Jacob Javits took to the Senate floor. The government of Israel has already stated that this was an erroneous attack by Israel's forces. The government of Israel has apologized. I am sure that it will do everything that one would expect by way of compensation and other appropriate measures, said the senator from <laughs> New York. Senator Frank Lauschi of Ohio, a member of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, praised Israel for its great valor during the war, calling it <laughs> heroism unequaled. Regarding the liberty, extreme caution should be exercised by the United States so that there will not be reimposed upon the Israel nation conditions on U.S. aid. Abraham Ribikoff, senator from Connecticut, spoke solemnly of the tragic loss of life on board the USS Liberty, the subject of armed attack but not before gushing. With dedication, courage, and heart, the Israeli people have fought a remarkable fight. The it was remarkable how they fucking blew up our, our naval vessel, dude. That shit was awesome. <laughs> they demonstrated profound courage when they torpedoed our NSA uh, civilian ship. You don't understand. Senator from New York, none other than Bobby Kennedy, named the perpetrator, to his credit, the tragic mistake of today when Israel's forces attacked a U.S. ship must alert us all, if further alert were needed, to the danger of the world we live in. But not before lauding Israel. Throughout this country and all over the world, men are moved and impressed by the bravery of Israel's people for the last four days, as for the 20 years before. Democrat representative from Illinois, Roman Puchinsky, also chimed in from the other side of Congress, again naming the culprit, it was with heavy heart that we learned a little while ago of the tragic mistake which occurred in the Mediterranean when an Israeli ship mistakenly attacked an American ship, followed by an all-too-familiar rhetorical device which endures to the present day. These are the tragic consequences of armed conflict. Shit happens, bro. Nobody's perfect. Calm down. Oh, God. You guys really have to... You guys really have to chill out, okay, with this whole, like, oh, Israel is not allowed to defend itself against its ally, the United States of America? What do you mean? Like, Israel is allowed to kill American soldiers. <laughs> what the fuck? And that was it. 
Sure, more than two dozen laws. Did APAC exist at the time? What the fuck? Why are the fuck are the congressmen so cucked? Okay, couple different things. APAC did not exist at the time because it was called something else. And ironically enough, JFK wanted to actually uh, change in the consideration of I forget what its prior iteration, what its prior name was called, but I, I that um, JFK at the time wanted to change it, uh, change its classification to a, a foreign lobby which it should be. Um, but having said that, having said that, one thing you have to remember, it's not just APAC, okay? It's not. APAC giving dollary dues to American congressmen is not the reason why these guys were dick riding uh, Israel into oblivion, okay? What I just described to you earlier about how important our uh, maintenance of the relationship with Israel was to American interests at the time is infinitely more important than APAC. Okay? No, this is not the Holocaust collective guilt era either. No. The most important, most significant aspect of this relationship was Israel's positioning in the region against other countries that were potentially aligning with the USSR. That's it. That's why I always tell you, like, APAC money and lobbying money in general, okay? Lobbying money in general only is important for times of need, like pressure points, where there's a lot of fucking people being like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? You're getting an un unlimited amount of money from Israel? What the fuck are you doing? Fuck you. Do something about it. We can't be, we can't be out here fucking uh, slaughtering children with our tax dollars. Like, spend it on us instead. That... Um, that is when APAC money comes into play. That is when the NRA money comes into play in times of political turmoil, when there is too much public demand. That's when you remember who's buttering your bread. Biden's statements one week prior signaled to some advocates that Washington may finally use its leverage to pressure Israel to end its abuses against Palestinians. In a CNN interview, the president said he would stop the transfer of artillery shells to Israel in the case of a Rafah invasion, and his, and his administration ultimately withheld one shipment of heavy bombs over the assault. But advocates say the media reports of the one billion transfer raises questions about Biden's commitment to protecting civilians in Rafah and standing up to Israel its long-time ally. Biden administration says that it is pushing for a ceasefire in Gaza and has often blamed Hamas for rejecting pro proposals to reach a deal to halt the fighting. But the United States has vetoed three separate ceasefire draft resolutions at the United Nations Security Council and voted against two at the General Assembly. Hamas has also accepted a deal put forward by Qatar and Egypt that would lead to a lasting ceasefire and the release of Israeli captives in Gaza and a number of Palestinian prisoners in Israel. The Israeli government rejected it. Lawmakers took to the floor to applaud Israel for its performance on the battlefield, but not a single other lawmaker mentioned the attack on the liberty the day that it became public knowledge. Each one of these expressions of sorrow were buried in speeches promoting Israel as an ally and, of course, championing aid to the country. Things didn't change much in this regard even as the facts of what happened came to light. How could this be? The Zionist project to colonize Palestine has existed in its modern form since the first Aliyah in 1882, to the land which was at that point still under Ottoman rule. Indeed, the earliest Zionist lobbies in the United States include the Zionist Organization of America, founded in 1897. With the establishment of the State of Israel, recognized by Harry Truman's government just minutes after the clock struck midnight on May the 14th, 1948, more lobbies would organize in order to secure aid to the nascent Jewish state. One would be more consequential than any other. It called itself the American Zionist Council. Its frontman in Washington, Isaiah Kennan, was previously the public relations official for the American branch of the Jewish Agency for Israel, formerly the Jewish Agency for Palestine. For this work, Kennan registered as a foreign agent in 1947, pursuant to the 1938 Foreign Agents Registration Act. But in 1951, Kennan assumed his new role as a lobbyist. The American Zionist Council's mission was securing aid to Israel. 
at this point still economic assistance, since Truman placed an arms embargo on the country calculated to avoid alienating Arab countries. Their first success came with the Mutual Security Act, the successor to the Marshall Plan that allotted tens of millions of dollars in aid to Israel, among other countries. This comprised the first major U.S. foreign aid package to the Jewish state. Kennan carefully crafted a model which endures to the present, and in celebration of the aid package, began sponsoring trips to Israel for members of Congress. Preempting the 1952 election, the American Zionist Council inserted political positions into the campaigns of both the Democrat and Republican candidates for the presidency. Pro-Israel positions would be represented across the board. The idea that tax-exempt donations were being used to lobby for aid to a foreign government irked the ensuing Eisenhower administration, writes Middle East policy scholar Stephen Spiegel. The tension between the Eisenhower administration and Israeli supporters was so acute that there were rumors, unfounded as it turned out, that the administration would investigate the American Zionist Council. Therefore, an independent lobbying group was formed within the auspices of the American Zionist Committee. And so, the American Zionist Committee for Public Affairs was born. Kennan would additionally put his background as a journalist to use, founding the Near East Report. Over the years, at the request of the Jewish Agency, the Jewish Agency for Israel made available to the American Zionist Council the sums listed below for subscriptions to the Near East Report. The weekly editorial would be sent to, ultimately, every single member of Congress. Money poured into the AZC coffers, courtesy of the Jewish Agency. When Executive Vice Chairman Gottlieb Hammer was asked, do you know, prior to 1960, approximately how much you supplied to the American Zionist Council, Hammer responded, my recollection would be somewhere in the neighborhood of around 600 to 700,000 prior to 1960. Each year, he was asked? Each year, yes, sir. The new decade would constitute a new era for the organization, especially for its lobbying arm, who, in 1959, would send a letter to the office of the Secretary of the U.S. Senate. This is to advise you that the American Zionist Committee for Public Affairs, which is registered with you, has changed its name to the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. At daybreak on June 9th, deck crews began cleaning up the wreckage of the USS Liberty, all that remained but the bodies, which were being stored in freezers and air-conditioned rooms. With hoses, they washed blood, flesh, and bone off the deck. Sailors even discovered a shoe with a foot still inside. Just two days after the attack, the Naval Court of Inquiry investigating the event convened in London. Admiral John McCain, Jr., Navy commander for Europe and the Middle East, appointed Rear Admiral Isaac Kidd, Jr. to lead the inquiry. And Kidd chose Captain Ward Boston as chief counsel. My name is Ward Boston, Jr. I'm a retired Navy captain, United States Navy. I was the counsel of the Court of Inquiry that was appointed by Admiral McCain as a result of the Israeli shooting. Yes, the John McCain. Not like the John McCain that you know. John McCain comes from a long line of uh, Navy admirals which is part of the reason why he was able to he was able to literally drop a shit ton like six american uh six american planes during vietnam and still be allowed to continue piloting planes brave revolutionary ho chi minh supporter john mccain destroying the american navy from within shooting up the uss liberty on 8 june 1967 their report was completed by the end of the month among their findings, the ship was hit by more than 821 shells and rockets, many of them incendiary. Notably, from the time of the first air attack onward, attackers were well-coordinated, accurate, and determined. Criss-crossing rocket and machine gun runs from both bows, both beams, and quarters effectively chewed up entire topside including ship control and internal communications. Well-directed initial air attacks had wiped out the ability of the 450 caliber machine guns to be effective. As for the torpedo boats which followed the jets, PT attack first developed from starboard side and was identified as a high-speed run-in. And very shortly thereafter, the commanding officer identified the Star of David flag on this lead boat. 
The inquiry addressed a number of Israeli explanations for what they maintained was an accidental attack on the liberty. Namely, the claim that the Israelis had mistaken the liberty for the Egyptian El Qutzer, which they say was sailing in the vicinity of a shell bombardment on the Sinai. Navy investigators called this resemblance highly superficial, saying El Qutzer is less than half the size and lacks the elaborate antenna array and distinctive hull markings of liberty. The location of the superstructure island, a primary recognition feature of merchant-type ships, is widely different. Further, they concluded, it is inconceivable that either the IDF Navy or Air Force would associate Liberty with her four 50 caliber machine guns, or El Qusayr, armed with two three-pounders, with a shore bombardment. Of course, the Israeli claim that the Liberty flew no flag was roundly contradicted by each witness, including Ensign David Lucas, Lieutenant Junior Grade Lloyd Painter, Ensign John Scott, who will remember was up... Excuse me. Who are you going to believe, dude? Your own fucking military or the most moral army on the planet? Yeah. According to Lindsey Graham, Israel's uh, defense brigade, Israel's defense force and his generals are more trustworthy than our generals. Our Department of Defense is compromised. They're gay. Israel, not gay. Up at dawn for deck watch, Lieutenant George Golden, RMC Wayne Smith, and of course, none other than the captain, McGonagall himself. Despite these findings, the report concluded that available evidence combines to indicate the attack on Liberty on June 8th was in fact a case of mistaken identity. The findings of the report were made in spite of a number of limitations, which would be described in detail, in a searing confession by the chief investigators themselves years later. Projections for the 1960s looked promising for the American Zionist Council, and their expenditures for 1962 to 1963 would constitute a media blitz, including a cultivation of editors, TV and radio interviews, positive articles in the Christian press and in academic journals, seminars in universities, distribution of books to libraries, monitoring of Arabs, among other initiatives. But the ambitious American Zionist Council would be cut short in their prime. Or would they? The AZC had caught the attention of the powerful Democrat senator from Arkansas, the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, James William Fulbright. Beginning in 1961, the Senate committee would charter an investigation into the nature and extent of efforts of foreign governments to influence the content and direction of United States foreign policy. Fulbright wasn't alone in his concerns. In late 1962, Assistant Attorney General J. Walter Yeagley informed his boss, Robert F. Kennedy, that we are soliciting next week the registration of the American Zionist Council under the Foreign Agents Registration Act, since it was reported that the Council received over $32,000 in subventions and over $11,000 as a special grant from the American section of the Jewish Agency for Israel. Under the Act, the receipt of such funds from the Jewish Agency constitutes the Council an agent of a foreign principal. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Yeagley, on behalf of the Department of Justice, orders the American Zionist Council to register as an agent of a foreign government. Less than two months later, six weeks to be exact, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee severs itself from the AZC to become its own corporation. However, APAC would not register as a foreign agent. Despite taking over the entire American Zionist Council's operations, the Fulbright investigation culminates in hearings later in the year, where it is revealed that the Jewish agency from January 1, 1955 through December 31, 1962, made payments totaling $5,100,000 to the American Zionist Council to carry on activities within the United States. Through its failure to require itemization, the Department of Justice and, therefore, the public, was unaware of the public relations activities in the interest of Israel carried on within the United States by the agency. It wasn't until the year 2004, when an aging Ward Boston, the senior legal counsel to the Navy Court of Inquiry into the Liberty attack, gave in to his guilty conscience. In a sworn affidavit that was inserted into the congressional record, Boston told all, 
For more than 30 years, I have remained silent on the topic of USS Liberty. However, recent attempts to rewrite history compel me to share the truth. Boston describes how he was assigned to the job while serving as a captain in the Judge Advocate General Corps. He goes on to list the flaws in the investigation. The late Admiral Isaac Kidd, president of the court, and I were given only one week to gather evidence for the Navy's official investigation into the attack. Despite the fact that we both had estimated that a proper court of inquiry into an attack of this magnitude would take at least six months. Despite these limitations, the pair were able to acquire damning evidence, much of which we went over earlier. The evidence was clear. Both Admiral Kidd and I believed with certainty that this attack, which killed 34 American sailors and injured 172, was a deliberate effort to sink an American ship and murder its entire crew. I recall Admiral Kidd repeatedly referring to the Israeli forces responsible for the attack as murderous bastards. Hammering the point home, the <laughs> Israeli attack was planned and deliberate and could not... Bro, that's very, very anti-Semitic of him to say that. Very fucked up. The United States has said that it cannot definitely determine whether Israel is using American weapons to violate international law. Nearly a month ago, the Biden administration issued a report saying that Israel offered credible and reliable assurances that U.S. arms are not being deployed to commit abuses. But various rights groups have documented numerous violations of international humanitarian law by the Israeli military which extensively uses U.S. weapons. Those reports include evidence of indiscriminate bombing, torture, and targeting civilians. When the U.S. government claimed that Israel has not launched a major invasion of Rafah, the Israeli offensive in Rafah had so far displaced 450,000 Palestinians from the city and further strained the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza, raising fear of catastrophic consequences. Possibly have been an accident. I am certain that the Israeli pilots that undertook the attack, as well as their superiors who had ordered the attack, were well aware that the ship was American. I saw the flag, which had visibly identified the ship as American, riddled with bullet holes, and her testimony that made it clear that the Israelis intended there be no survivors. It was an intended attack, <coughs> deliberate, well-planned, except not well-executed because they didn't sink the ship. Not only did the Israelis attack the ship with napalm, gunfire, and missiles, Israeli torpedo boats machine-gunned three lifeboats that had been launched in an attempt by the crew to save the most seriously wounded, a war crime. Their superior, Admiral McCain, was adamant that we were not to travel to Israel or contact the Israelis concerning this matter. Finally, Boston writes that the late Admiral Kidd had personally told him that President Lyndon Johnson and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara ordered him to conclude that the attack was a case of mistaken identity despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. It's one of those situations where when political action takes over, when you're told by the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense to keep your mouth shut, don't say anything, and that's a direct order. That the inquiry should have lasted months and not days is evidenced by the investigation of the spy ship Pueblo, captured by North Korea and its crew held hostage for 11 months in 1968. While the Liberty's inquiry lasted eight days and produced 158 pages of transcripts, the Pueblo investigation lasted nearly four months and produced a transcript almost 3,400 pages long. Of course, Boston was far from the only person who felt the way he did. Then NSA director, Lieutenant General Marshall Carter, commanded the agency which the Liberty reported to. He was never convinced of the official story, telling his interviewer for an oral history, it couldn't be anything else but deliberate. There's just no way you could have a series of circumstances that would justify it being an accident. So said his deputy director of operations, Oliver Kirby. One shot would be an accident, or even one torpedo. But there was damage from all directions. We knew it was deliberate. It was very well planned, premeditated. They knew exactly what they were doing. Assistant Deputy Director of Operations, Brigadier General John Morrison Jr., concurred. We just couldn't believe that. We knew what the Liberty stood for. 
We knew what it looked like. It was not a small ship. It was a large ship. They being a bright bunch of folks, we had to believe that they knew. They saw the silhouette of the ship. They knew when they looked at it what it was. Our flag was flying. Thomas L. Hughes directed the State Department's own intelligence agency, the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. In six strafing runs, it appears remarkable that none of the aircraft pilots identified the vessel as American. He'd type in a memo to Acting Secretary of State Nicholas Katzenbach five days after the attack. The torpedo boat attack was made approximately 20 minutes after the air attack. The surface attack could have been called off in that time had proper air identification been made. Liberty crew members were able to identify and record the whole number of one of the small, fast-moving torpedo boats during the two minutes that elapsed between their attack run and the launching of the first torpedo. But the Israeli boat commanders apparently failed to identify the much larger and more easily identifiable Liberty at 11,000 tons, 455 feet long, large identification numbers on hull. Granville Austin was director of the Near East and South Asia office at the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, making him a centrally placed official for intelligence on the attack. Everybody knew it wasn't an accident. They knew damn well what it was. That it was an accident, of course, was nonsense. At CIA as well, doubts persisted and permeated through the highest levels. An official CIA history of Director Richard Helms's tenure, which included the attack on the Liberty, reads, Although Israeli authorities in Tel Aviv immediately apologized for the grievous accident, many informed Americans soon came to believe that the assault had been anything but accidental. CIA initially resisted this judgment, but the cumulative weight of the evidence rapidly undermined this position. The CIA history also quotes then-Deputy CIA Director Vice Admiral Rufus Taylor in a letter to Director Helms. To me, the picture thus far presents the distinct possibility that the Israelis knew that Liberty might be their target and attacked anyway, either through confusion in command and control or through deliberate disregard of instructions on the part of subordinates. And let's not forget the director himself, who would sit down for his oral history interviews in 1984. About the Liberty, Helm said, Since this is for the agency's record, I don't think there can be any doubt that the Israelis knew exactly what they were doing. Why they wanted to attack the Liberty, whose bright idea this was, I can't possibly know. But any statement to the effect that they didn't know that it was an American ship and so forth is nonsense. I have always assumed without knowing the truth of the matter that somebody in the Israeli hierarchy figured that the ship was monitoring what the Israelis were doing in Syria, and that before they attacked in the Golan Heights, they didn't want the United States to try to stop them from getting on with the job. So the thing to do was to take out this vessel and stop our ability to hear the transmission of their messages. That's just my surmise. A conversation followed by pages and pages of redactions. President Johnson himself reportedly fumed. Less than two weeks after the attack, Charles Roberts, reporting for Newsweek, cited a top-level theory that someone in the Israeli armed forces ordered the Liberty sunk because he suspected it had taken down messages showing that Israel started the fighting. President Johnson was the magazine's source. Holy shit! In a seemingly logic-defying twist of fate, the period following June 8, 1967, would be precisely the moment that the real sea change took place in terms of the absolute amount of U.S. aid to Israel. The efforts of the lobby to stifle dissenting views in Congress and to push for the lifting of the arms embargo began to bear fruit. Indeed, just months after the Liberty attack, and with all that had come to light about it, that lobby began pressuring the new Special Assistant for National Security, Walt Rostow, who proved more susceptible to these pressures, and the embargo was lifted. A lobby, as we've seen, that was an entirely foreign creation, set up and seed-funded to advance Israel's interests at the expense of the United States. Indeed, despite Johnson's fury, in which he went so far as to tell Newsweek's Charles Roberts that he believed the Liberty attack was deliberate, he himself caved to the pressure, as documented by Henry Kissinger in a 1969 strategy document. 
Congress subsequently furnished Israel with its first major arsenal of U.S. weapons, fighter planes, replacing France as Israel's main arms supplier in doing so. Those mystères and mirages which strafed and napalmed the Liberty would be swapped with F-4 Phantoms, and soon enough, F-15s and 16s would follow. Approved by a Congress that, it appears, didn't have the excuse of not knowing the obvious. By the end of the month of the Liberty attack, on June 29th, the House heard clearly for themselves the outrage of Representative Craig Hosmer, a Navy reservist who served in World War II. Hosmer was well-versed in ship identification. I can only conclude that the coordinated attack by aircraft and motor torpedo boats on the USS Liberty, 15 and a half miles north of Sinai on June 8th, which killed 34 officers and men of the Navy and wounded another 75, was deliberate. The fact that the USS Liberty was a victory hull vessel, hundreds of which were produced and used by the U.S. Navy during World War II and since, rules out the possibility of mistaken identity. Every ship recognition book in the world has for years identified the characteristic victory hull and superstructure of the USS Liberty as U.S. Navy property. Thomas Abernathy took the floor moments later. The Democrat representative from Mississippi spoke candidly. I have heard members of this House, and many, many others, say that if this had been done by others, the leaders of our government would have moved in with sternness and appropriate demands or even retaliatory action. Regardless of who is responsible, friendly or unfriendly, when American sons are unnecessarily killed by unprovoked military attack, even in a case of mistaken identity, Uncle Sam as a rule demands to know why. And ordinarily, we do not stop with just a demand. The ship was well marked, so said the Pentagon. Its name was painted on its stern. U.S. letters and numbers were on its bow. The day was clear, and it was distinctly flying the flag that you and I... So the people asking why, <clears throat> the speculation at the time is the most likely reason is because they thought that America would... Um, potentially move against Israel if they saw what Israel was planning to do in Syria and that they were surveilling Israeli communication as well and they wanted to put an end to that. I heard Israel never attacks first. Yeah, well, part of the reason why you think that is because even when Israel attacks first, which is almost all the time, it's seen as um, not premeditated but actually defensive. They'll wipe out the entirety of the fucking Egyptian uh, Air Force and then be like, we did it defensively. He stood here and so praised and respected just a few days ago on Flag Day. What complaint have we registered? What has Washington said? To tell you the truth, this great capital as well as this great government, if it can still be called great, was and is as quiet as the tomb regarding this horrible event. Few other elected leaders said or did anything. Of the 435 House members, only Hosmer and Abernathy spoke out during the three and a half hours that legislative body met. No one in the Senate, which met for less than two hours, mentioned the attack. It's not a mystery as to why. The reason for such silence from Congress, and for, not to mention, impunity from consequence from the invasions of Lebanon, siege of Beirut, the occupation, annexation, and apartheid in the Palestinian territories, the continued genocide in Gaza, or from the very outset, the deliberate attempt to sink an American ship and its crew, the reason for such total impunity was there all along for everyone to see. That a foreign government has operated freely through its agents in the American democratic system. The Biden administration has claimed that it applies the same standards to Israel in enforcing the Leahy law, which prohibits assistance to foreign military units that commit abuses. Last month, the U.S. State Department said that it would not suspend aid to any Israeli battalions, despite acknowledging that five units had engaged in gross violations of human rights. Washington said four of the battalions had taken remedial steps to address the abuses and the U.S. is engaging with Israel over the fifth unit. But experts say the U.S. has a special process in applying the Leahy law to Israel, giving the country more time and leeway to address allegations of abuse. The Biden administration has claimed that it 
cut off funding to the United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees to comply with the law. The law in question is a government funding bill that Congress passed in March banning aid to UNRWA. The UN agency provides vital services to millions of Palestinians across the Middle East and has played a leading role in aid delivery in Gaza. Biden supported the funding legislation and signed it into law. Washington had also suspended its assistance to the agency weeks before the bill was approved, following Israeli allegations of links between UNRWA and Hamas. Last month, an independent review of UNRWA commissioned by the UN found that Israel did not provide credible evidence to back its accusations. If you found this video informative, then make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. And thanks for watching.